We also could end up in an income situation from Form 8853 for the Archer MSAs and long-term care insurance contracts in certain situations. We might go into the uh, MSAs uh, in a future presentation in a bit more detail, but I'm not gonna dive into that in a lot more detail at this time. And then you could have situations where income could result from the uh, health savings account, the HSAs, which again, we might talk about the HSAs a little bit more detail in future presentations, but you can look at the form uh, 8889 and instructions for more detail there. Then we've got the jury duty pay. Now the jury duty pay gets a little bit messy in terms of like, did the employer uh, compensate for the jury duty pay and so on and, and so forth. But usually the jury duty pay uh, is often like kind of insignificant in relation to the overall pay. And usually it's going to be, you know, a taxable uh, item. So I'm going to say a uh, jury duty pay here. Let's say it was, you know, a thousand dollars for jury duty pay pulls in to line uh, 8H. And then obviously populates down here, pulls into the form 1040, which is now included on the total income line eight and then included in line nine let's go back on over to the schedule uh, one schedule one and then we've got uh, jury duty we've got the prizes and awards so if we had prizes and awards again uh, that would be here like notice that this would be different because the prizes and reward awards although you earned them aren't usually subject to Social Security and Medicare. So notice that's significantly different than if you put the prizes and awards or for jury duty for, for the same thing on Schedule C or something like that, because then you'll probably be calculating Social Security and Medicare. So that's one of the main things you kind of want to be keeping in your mind is this income. And if it's income, it's it's less burdensome to be including it where it doesn't have the Social Security and Medicare uh, involved. So activity engaged in uh, in for profit. And I believe that's the hobby income. And so again, significant not for profit engaged activity. So in other words, you might be doing stuff. The classic example is like horse racing. <laughs> you had rich people that liked to race horses and they and they and they often tried to take losses on the horse racing because it, it wasn't a profitable thing oftentimes. And then they would get these benefits from from like horse racing and and but really it's just a hobby because so so now if the IRS says it's a hobby it's like well now you got to record the the winnings and not really the losses uh you know the losses might be included includable up to the amount of the winnings kind of situation right so now it's it's a not for profit activity so if I go back in here and I jump then I'm going to say let's put you know the 10,000 here let's say that's going to now pull in here now the benefit of it pulling in uh, to to the ten thousand here is that you don't have the social security taxes on it as you would if it was W two income. So if it pulls in here, notice you might get forms like a ten ninety nine types of forms for your hobby, and you'd say, well, it's but it's a hobby, it's not for profit, and therefore possibly not be subject to social security and Medicare. The downside is that if it was a for-profit business, like the horse racing, the people that have the horse racing are trying to claim it was self and a for-profit is that you can report the 10,000 and then they had expenses for their hobby that way exceeded, of course, uh, the 10,000 of revenue resulting in a loss. That's what the IRS is gonna be skeptical of, losses, because the loss, they remember, they wanna take a piece of the income. They want a piece of your profits. They don't wanna take the risk of losses, right? They don't want to be paying for your hobbies. So, so that's uh, so, so that's the pros and cons of the hobby income. If you get a 1099, is it a business? It could be bit good or bad if it was business income or hobby income, but you need to be able to determine the two. If it's business income, it could be good if you had expenses more than the amount of the income, because then you might have losses but it could be bad because if you don't have the expenses and you're just recording the income, then of course you're gonna be subject to the self-employment tax. Now it used to be that you'd say, well, if it's hobby income, maybe they, you can get a deduction on the schedule A similar to the, it's like the gambling losses, but basically they made a change fairly recently. So you don't really even get the capacity to deduct the hobby losses up to the uh, income amount on you know the schedule A uh, type of situation. So. So that's gonna be the general rule with the hobbies. 
Then we've got the stock options. This would usually be for more well-off individuals that are getting paid in the form of, of stock options. Now you gotta be careful in terms of is the value being included in say a W-2 form or whatnot. And then if, if not, if you have to record the added income, then again, it's another kind of income that's not included anywhere else. Therefore it's in the other income category here. Next line, income from rental of personal property. If you engaged in the rental for profit, but were not in the business of renting such property. So again, it's somewhat of a strange situation. Normally the rental property would be reported on uh, the schedule E, but if you follow into the specific area, possibly you report it in the other income here. And then we have this Olympic and Paralympic medals uh, and USOC prize money. That's obviously a fairly unusual type of situation where you have someone has the prize money from, uh, from athletic money like this, but obviously the Olympics are are, are something where you could see why there might be you know an exception of that kind of uh, of prize money and that seems reasonable to me try to try to get those people the top of the podium on the on the prize money for the for the olympics and whatnot but but whatever so there's that one we're going to continue on a few more of these possibly in uh future presentations but the general rule of course is that they would be summing up over here if you've got to include another income pull it into the first page of the form 1040 and being included here and there's a difference being included in other income and having for uh for profit type of income subject to self-employment such as schedule c income and oftentimes rental income has its own kind of set of situations and rules as well so if it doesn't fall as for profit income it's not normal kind of rental income schedule c schedule e then possibly and you got to put it somewhere then you would think it might be falling somewhere on that line eight other income schedule one